Hello and welcome to OT the podcast. We're here to talk about watches, time, some spicy details. Amsterdam. <laughs> How to spend it. My name's Felix Schultz. We got distracted there, Andy. What's going on? <laughs> I did. I'm Andy Green. Well, Felix, we have a uh, action-packed episode today. The main event, if you will, is Jasper Liffring from Amsterdam Vintage Watches, aka the King of Vintage or KOV as uh, he's known on the YouTubes. That's good. that's a great chat. I can't wait for everyone to hear it. It's got so many titles, so many sobriquets. Um, KOV. Yeah. Oh, I don't have any follow-up to that. What's been going on, Andy? Can I tell you what's been going on? Why don't you start? I got it. I'm, I'm very excited about this. You know I'm excited about this. Mm. This week, um, Tag Heuer uh, announced a collaboration that they had teased with with one of my favorite characters, let's be honest. One me? of the greatest people I know, Mario. Thank you. Oh, it's a me. <laughs> it's a me, a Mario. <laughs> uh, so Nintendo and Tag Heuer have teamed up for a Mario-themed connected watch, which makes mm. sense. I mean, if you're going to put Mario on a watch, it's going to be a smartwatch. Um, it's it's a limited edition, which is which is interesting. It looks cool; comes in a nice red little package. But then there's some there's some nice details. The, the bezel has at the sort of the cardinal points Mario's iconic power up. So there's a star, a mushroom, and uh, I think the warp pipe. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I like about it is that, as with any sort of you know uh, connected watch in 2021, excuse me, Andy. <clears throat> <clears throat> As with any connected watch in 2021, it's geared towards uh, you know fitness, really. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and so you can set goals. You know, you got to you know close your rings, whatever the terminology is. But with Mario, you get little rewards when you hit one of your daily metrics. Okay. And so Mario is on the screen when it's sort of you know can have him on the screen when the phone uh, when the watch is uh, not active. And he runs around with you. And the closer you get to hitting your sort of target goal, the mm. more frantic and, dare we say, sweaty Mario gets, which I think is a kind of ridiculous and cute way of dealing with it. Like it's... Look, it, teamwork makes the dream work. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's not exactly a personal trainer, but he's uh, a supportive plumber. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's exciting. Well, I've got a question. Before we, before we move mm. on to whatever you've been up to, what other video game franchise characters would you like to see on a watch face? Connected video or analog? Hmm. Donkey Angry Kong Birds. would be good. <laughs> Donkey, Donkey Kong. Kong would be. Yeah, he'd be good. Oh, that'd be, I reckon there's there's room. There's someone out there has got to make a complication like where a little animatronic Donkey Kong throws a barrel yeah. and it uh, goes into the, the hour. Maybe we'll get uh, Francois Paul Jean on it. He, yeah, or, or or we could talk to Benny Harnett from Audemars. Oh, uh, no, he's he's with another, um, uh, another franchise. franchise. Yeah. Mm. Uh, what have you been doing, time, Andy? Well, I was going to say, every time you start the chrono, it could be like, it's on like Donkey Kong. It could be like, oh, oh that, that's great. Like, or like that Amiga text, you know, <laughs> what could you do in 14 seconds? Like, <laughs> <laughs> On the case back, just, yeah. You know who I like? Who? We, we both like this person, actually. He's one of the nicest people in the in the watch world. I would, mm. I would go so far as to say he, the dive timer himself, Jason Heaton. <sighs> I've had him on the pod a couple of times now. He's Is this an Man author. Crush Wednesday, Monday or something? Man, Man Crush Monday? Uh, this episode comes out on Friday, Andy. Wow. It's um, Fantastic Fella Friday. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, Jason Heaton, look, not just... Andy and Felix like Jason Eaton. Everybody likes Jason Eaton. And this has been confirmed by the comment section on the latest Talking Watchers, starring none other than Jason Eaton. How good is it? So Jack Forster interviews Jason Eaton via Zoom, we'll call it. Some um, sort of remote remote platform. And just... Here's, here's about Jason's watch collecting. And and look, if you've um, listened to The Grey Nato, if you've listened to Jason on uh, on our show a couple of times now, you'll be a, a, across, you know, what draws him to watches and sort of his journey and uh, his his mindset and approach. But uh, it's just such a wholesome sort of 12-minute video to, to get stuck into. And, yeah, and the thing I like about it is that um, it's personally, but I think more broadly, he's, he's really, really relatable. Like... Mm. Sometimes these, you know, you're on the gram or you're on the, you know, on Talking Watchers certainly in the past. And it's like, yeah, this this is one a one-off Patek Minute repeater that was owned by the king of Sweden in 1928 and it cost me a gajillion dollars. There's a mm. bit of that vibe going on. Um, 
and Jason, Jason's collection is, I think, certainly representative of of where I've been. Like he, you know, we got interested in watches at the same time, same as you. And it's a, it's an evolution, and it's a natural evolution. And there's personal connections in there, and there's mm. there's you know not a particular theme in some. Well, actually, there's a lot of dive watches. Let's be honest, but <laughs> I think um, it's exclusively dive watches. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but it's not like he's only collecting AP or only collecting no vintage Rolex. No. He's it's very um, organic seeming to me, and, and you know I I, I really vibe with that and i think a lot of people he as as jason says in the video he accumulates he doesn't collect yeah 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 yeah. i think that's that's a good way of putting it well done jason uh yeah we should we should link that up uh well we will uh (laughs) speak i'm not sure of like the segue here that's um entirely Mm. appropriate speaking of life have you seen sex life on netflix felix uh i've seen a very small portion of it as (laughs) suggested to me through a social media viral meme, small thing. portion or big portion, a portion, a portion, a, uh, a surprising, but not that <laughs> shocking proportion. <laughs> uh, yeah, so something I was I've, I've watched the series on on Netflix, and something really kind of stood out to me, uh, and oh and for its size, uh, are, we, are we about to lose our uh, just is about Apple, is Apple going to pull this? Episode? Just about just about whacked me in the face. One of okay. the um one of the the main male leads uh-huh. in the show. Uh-huh. Uh, look, I I stared at it and I was like, "Is this real? Is this fake?" And I'm sure a uh-huh. lot of people that are into it uh, have, that have seen the show have that same thought: like, "This this can't be real." It it, it just didn't look. Did you have like, to like screen get, grab and zoom? I paused. Like I screen grabbed. Yep. I pulled up another photo for reference, and mm-hmm. I spent way too much time analyzing doing the whole real or fake conversation. But yeah, sure. One of the main characters, basically, it's sort of a show about a love triangle. You know, happily married woman, uh, kind of. The past, a spark from the past is sort of reignited, but her oh, husband, who's the the perfect husband, he's wearing this uh, Rolex Daytona, and the proportions are just all off. At first, I thought maybe it's just not fitted well, mm. um, and then no, he's a big guy. He's got a big wrist. It's just way too big, and it's uh, unfortunately, Felix, it's a prop. But if you're a, if you're a watch enthusiast, you'll notice that he wears a um, just a can't prop. miss it. It's a it's a panda Daytona that you just can't miss. Yep. Uh, the female lead herself, she wears a I can't actually pick it, but I think it's either a Hermes or a, or a Cartier uh, little sort of precious metal piece on um, mm. on the brown leather strap. But what I did find interesting was that I noticed that there's like a lot of watch placement throughout the show. Like it's not a product placement, but all the main characters seem to be wearing watches. It's something that gets put on, taken off, and it's very present even in flashbacks. So I found uh, that really interesting. That is interesting. Do you think is it? Uh, and I'm not familiar with uh, the show more broadly. Um, is it because it's it's sort of is it meant to be like a, a luxury, well off mm. to do sort of set? Yeah, oh, and that's the other thing. I noticed uh, one of the sort of the second secondary characters was wearing um, one of those the Bulgari. Uh, what is it? The Sir? It's not a Serpenti. What's yeah, the other? Yeah. What's the uh, what no, no, the, sh- like? the teardrop teardrop shape? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I mean the, the Diva's Dream or the. It sort of looks like a snake head. Mm, yes, it looks like a snake head. Yeah, they've got serpentis that are not the big curly bracelets. That's you know, it's a bigger. And that head. looked that looked real. So whether yes, it was a serpenti, but it was just like the the single on a strap, single pass a on a strap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which was um. Do you reckon um, uh, the leads? Uh, you know, shocking, shocking watch faux pas. Was it a, like? Do you reckon it was a branded Rolex or was it like a? Kind of want to be. No, it was branded. It was just yeah. not not legit. Not, not legit. Um, yeah, sure. And it was it was a very imp- like again. It sort of you know he takes it off to get into the into the pool, and then you know he's always putting it on when he comes down the stairs to get morning. So it, it had significance to um to whoever you know placed it in the show. Well, and, I, yeah, I reckon it's like how do we how do we signal that this is like a affluent. Yeah. Yeah, he's like a hedge fund guy. So yeah, it sure. makes I mean, sense. that makes it, sense. Yeah. It makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah. All right, Felix, enough about sex life. We need to talk about something that's also sexy, the new Tag Heuer Aqua Racer collection. Very sexy indeed, Andy. This week's episode of OT The Podcast is brought to you by Tag Heuer. Tag Heuer has given the Aqua Racer a significant upgrade this year. We've been talking to you about it for the last few weeks. Today, though, if you will pardon the pun, we're going to dive a little deeper into the update. Top line, Andy. Top line. The Aqua Racer got a bunch of small refinements that add up to a significant change. So there's a lot of little design tweaks that the the Tag Heuer team have pulled. The main one for me is 
the slimmer, more refined case. And one detail that I particularly love is the edges of the bezels and the case sides have been chamfered. So you get that really nice play between the finishes, uh, which you know makes it a little bit more reflective and uh, classy looking on the wrist. Some other notable updates are the bracelet. There's been some good changes there. It's been refined a little bit, made more ergonomic. But the real talking point I think about it is, and we'll get to what you think about it, is I know you love a, a sliding buckle. Mm. They've put a sliding buckle on it. So 1.5 centimeters of on-the-go adjustment. They have tweaked the dial design, which will, which I've got some very strong thoughts about. And they've put the Cyclops under the Sapphire Crystal, which is unusual, but kind of cool. You've been wearing them for the last week or so. What do you think about them? Yeah, so Felix, I got a big box of Tag Heuer. I got some 43 models and 36 models, which was quite exciting. I think the first thing you really notice when you put on the new Acura is the octagonal design touches. It just feels like a really modern, you know, sort of 2021 watch compared mm. to the previous model. These touches go from, like you said, the bezel to the case chamfering to the indices to the hands. And it's just a really kind of cohesive look. The other thing when I kind of looked at the collection in a hole in the in the in the box was that it's very uh, the cars are very vibrant and strong and they they really do stand out especially in the sun the other thing that stood out to me and i should actually say jumped out is the loom and there's for that's for a few reasons firstly the brightness is insane after just you know standing outside or by the window the hands light up and when i say light up like they're glowing with um with not much airtime secondly i really like the discrete using use of color coding uh, you'll notice if you head to the website actually head to tagway's website you'll see loom shot and you'll see that the minute and second hand as well as the triangle on the bezel are actually contrasted to a light blue mm. whereas the rest of the loom is green and that's you know obviously really handy if you're putting this watch to work the hands and the markers are also really generously filled with loom so it just makes for a really legible watch all round if you want to know about on the wrist well you do notice that slimmer case you know it is just a few millimeters smaller but the overall impact on volume is really noticeable the underside of the lugs actually taper as well so they sit on the wrist nicely and it's it's a comfortable watch to wear that slide adjustment that you mentioned does you know come in handy and it did more than once mm. it's really easy to use it just sort of slides up and down and the last thing felix that i that i like when you sort of talk to is the use of just slight polish touches here and there. Tag Heuer haven't overdone it. And I think that's important for a tool watch. You know, primarily it's a brushed case and there are just these little touches of polishing, polishing here and there that make it, it stand out. And what I found that meant was that things like the polished markers really, really pop uh, as opposed to and against the brush case. Absolutely. Now, I want to talk about the dial in a second, but something that we sort of had a bit of a, a bit of WhatsApp messaging around was around sizing. So you had the, the 36 mil ones there mm. as well, which are sort of, I think, you know, there's diamonds and on one of them and there's a wavy dial detail, mm. probably aimed at women. How did you find that size, given that you, you're a big fan of a 36 mil case? Yeah, 20, well, I mean, the last 12 months have been the year of me wearing a, a 36 watch for most of it. I found it really interesting and wearable. Look, the, the blue dial had diamonds. That was probably a little bit too sparkly for me, but otherwise they they wore really nicely and they wear a little bit bigger because it does have, you know, that sort of longer case. So if you, you, you can wear it, you can size it up and down and Tag Heuer have proved that the design, you know, has scale to it. Yeah, sure. So if the, the 43 is the, you know, the air quote regular one and there's 36. I, you know, saw these watches briefly, you know, I had a meeting with Tag Heuer, saw some of the new collection and I, they sort of talked about the, the updates, like, you know, mm. they talked about the case and I immediately got the case. I immediately got the bracelet, like how these are substantial improvements. But what I didn't really peg until later and I looked at the, the watch in comparison to the older one is just how different the dial design is. And it's still got that sort of um, uh, horizontal brush. It's got that, you know, garage door vibe. And it's, you know, a lot of Tag Heuer codes, like the, the second hand has that nice trapezoidal uh, loom pip on the end. But the big change for me is that they've gone from all applied batten sort of indices to cardinal points of 3, 6, 9, 12 are your, your, your battens. Mm. And then there's big loom dots on everything else. It's, it's a classic dive watch style. And for me, it just makes a wild change to the overall look and feel. And you're, you're absolutely right. You said it really, really well. When I think this is a, a modern 
dive watch for 2021. Like it's not it's not a throwback, even though it sort of dates back to you know 1978, I believe. Yeah, not a throwback at all, and that's it's it's a really interesting evolution. Like it feels like that next generation of you know cars. Sort of you know if we take the 911, the Porsche 911 as an example here, where it's sort of like slide update, slide update, and then a new a new one comes out, and it's this is this feels like the new one. And it and it just it feels like it's in a new body altogether, which is really cool. Well, this might be the time to ask then, Andy, if you mm. could have one, like one from the current collection, and I'm sure there's going to be more releases, you know, this year probably. If you could have one of the ones that you uh, have spent some time with, which one would it be? Okay, so I have two answers to this. The first one is the special edition Aqua Racer that uh, that paid homage to the reference 844. Mm-hmm. I had that a few weeks earlier. That's the black dial with the sort of um, the patina look on the hands and the markers and sort of that really cool rubber strap. I don't think that that's going to be realistic because it's pretty limited and and, and hard to find one. But sure. if I can't have that and I have to choose from the sort of regular production piece, then I think I'm going to navy blue. I, I really liked the color on it. Uh, it's vibrant, stands out, kind of screams summer to me. So I'm, I'm about the, the navy blue. Cool beans. What about you? Well, look, I've um, been pretty sort of out and proud for my love of that titanium edition with the green, uh, mm. that, that ra- the radially brushed ceramic bezel just, uh, just kills me. Like that's something that no one really does. Like, and especially on a piece at this sort of price point, that's really, really, it's a nice and sophisticated touch. And I love that combination of green and yellow. I'm still, a bit, you know, titanium, it's a watch. I've had a you know titanium watches in the past, and it's got to mm. be something you wear for the right occasion. So if that colorway was in steel, I would be all over it. So that's the only for me. But if not, I'm quite partial to the 43 mil with the silver dial and that high contrast black bezel. I just I've, I've always loved that sort of colorway, and I think it really it adds that like high contrast diver you know tool vibes, but he's also a little bit fancy. Uh, look, I agree, and I'd happily share a titanium uh, aqua racer with you uh, should we need to. And if nice. we want to, if you want to know the price, Felix, that titanium aqua racer is six thousand one hundred Aussie dollars. The limited edition I mentioned is six thousand three hundred Aussie dollars, and the regular production steel pieces in forty three are four thousand three hundred and fifty, whilst the thirty six models are four thousand one hundred Aussie dollars. You have got those numbers absolutely correct, Andy Green. Uh, to discover more about the new Tag Heuer Aqua Racer, head to tagheuer.com or your local Tag Heuer boutique. And let's get back to the show, Andy. Andy, enough about the Aqua Racer. Mm. We have to get Yasma on the line and talk about all things vintage. Can't wait. Let's do it, Felix. Felix, today's guest hails from Amsterdam, where he sells vintage watches for a living and does so with a little bit of humor. In fact, some call him the king of vintage. Welcome to OT the podcast, Jasper Liffering from Amsterdam Vintage Watches, a little shop in the Netherlands with a massive presence. Thank you so much. You need to work on your pronunciation, though. It's Jasper Liffering. Oh. Liffering. <laughs> Liffering. I'll read it later. The rest of the intro was uh, very fine. Thank you so much. <laughs> Happy to be here, Andy and Felix. You know, it's funny. My, my icebreaker question to you was, yeah, you're not, not afraid to say what you think. Do you think it's a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, I think it can work both ways. It uh, has bit me in the ass before. <laughs> However, I think it's also uh, something that is appealing to our uh, clientele and to our online following uh, to follow somebody that actually gives his opinion instead of just says what everybody else says. Absolutely. Now, I think before we sort of get into, you know, you saying what you think and how that might have gotten you into a bit of trouble in the past, how did you get your start in watches? If I'm not mistaken uh, Amsterdam Vintage Watches has been around for 30 years or so is that right? Exactly I'm 28 myself so obviously uh, I didn't start it myself (laughs) yeah I'm a young fucker still um, so basically my, uh, my parents started, my father is a goldsmith, so he mm-hmm. started a, a jewelry business where he made his own jewelry just from, uh, like scratch yet, um, he was getting some trouble, uh, with his, uh, muscles and stuff. So instead he started trading jewelry and art parts like, uh, paintings or whatever, but he already enjoyed the, the things from the past more because it has more, um, more passion in it it has more manual labor in it so he started doing that with old old uh, rings and old uh, mirrors or, or everything you can find w- what's cool and instead of uh, going with that flow i decided to move it up to mainly watches uh, first of all i also uh, dealt jewelry as i uh, studied gemology yet 
my true passion lays within the watches. So the past six years, I've been dealing watches for 80 hours a week at least. Yeah, fantastic. What was it like kind of carrying on that family business? Well, it's crazy. First of all, there's a huge amount of pressure because uh, when I took it over, I was like 21 and it Mm -hmm. was kind of abrupt because my parents' health was a little bit declining. So it was like, okay, you're done with your studies. Now you got to carry on the family legacy, let's say like that. Uh, However, I had a totally different view of it. So I did want to do it, but only if I can do it my way, which was totally unlike my parents did it. And they were pretty afraid and I felt the pressure very much. But in the end, I think I uh, handled it properly. Yeah, amazing. And and as you kind of you kind of said, you did it your way, and it is a very different business now. Uh, you know, if I think recently you did a feature on Vice, did you ever think that that would be where your family kind of watch and jewelry store took you? Um, that's the crazy part. I was never a visionary. I wasn't. I didn't set out a plan when I took over the shop. I was just like, okay, I want to do it like this. Let's mm-hmm. just fucking do it like this. Let's start today. Uh, changing the behavior of uh, or the approach of the whole business uh, and it just grew into this so it has never been a, a, a solid plan we just did what we wanted to do and it ended up having a, I ended up having a very good team around me and we just expanded the business with a uh, second store or more of a lounge next door and our team doubled in uh, in number and our revenue quadrupled at least so that's good. Yeah, awesome. Now you sort of said a few ways, uh, a few times already that you wanted to do it your way, like in your own style, I suppose. Yeah. What is that? What makes it different from everyone else? Well, I felt when I was like 15 or 16 years old, I was already very interested in watches, but the whole watch scene was very, um, let's say, traditional. Um, so when a 16 year old kid comes in and he wants to try on a Rolex or whatever, their approach of the salesman would be like, uh, oh, I'm sorry, sir, but this is a real Rolex. So, you know, you mm. can't afford it anyway. So what are you doing here? And I felt it was so disappointing because I really wanted to get into watches, but there wasn't one channel or one uh, person in particular or one store that actually gave the clientele the service and the feeling that it deserves when you purchase such a, a great uh, e- example that lasts for your lifetime. Uh, so I just wanted to make it like a nice, I wanted to make the store a nice place where people come in and they actually enjoy the watches uh, regardless if they buy it or if they don't. And I think that by itself in our um, our business is already a, a huge difference in how the regular ADs, for example, approached our clientele. Yeah, it's fantastic. And and in that Vice video, you know, you mentioned working, I think, 70 hours a week, and you've just said 80. So, you know, you're getting busier, uh, busier by the month. How do you keep the hustle going? <laughs> well, first of all, it's it's such a cliche. But if you love your work, you'd never work a day in your life. So yeah, the first thing I do when I wake up is check my messages. And nine out of 10 are about watches. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I just get started. And uh, before I go to bed, I check Instagram feed to see if there's still some watches that I can snatch up and purchase or whatever. So it's just for me, literally, it's every waking hour of the day that I'm working with watches uh, that sometimes my personal life suffers. But my girlfriend doesn't really love that. Um, yet for me, it's just the thing is, I- I'm so driven because I just fucking love what we do. So therefore, it's it's easy to keep up with it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, it's it is cliche, but it, it makes a lot of sense, and it's really evident in what you do and sort of how you know you've taken this younger and fresh approach and, and brought it to life. I think if we if we kind of look at social media, which is something you you've mentioned, I'm curious because you you and your store are probably the highest profile dealers that I can think of. You know, in terms of in terms of presence on the platform, it's it's super unusual for a, a watch dealer to have you know 150 thousand followers on Instagram, for example, how important and how significant has this been to your business? Thank you very much. First of all, I appreciate it. (laughs) Uh, Once again, this also grew like naturally. Um, We never intended to be this big online, uh, but it's now really a big factor that comes into play when we are selling watches. For example, one of the best selling watches in our store is a simple Rolex Stages. Uh, We only do the 36 millimeter ones because we believe that's the correct size. Uh, And when we have such a watch, we post it on Instagram. And since we have also a very big engagement, so like one third of our following actually checks our story. So 50,000 people Mm -hmm. that are interested in watches see this one day just and it's going to be sold within 10 minutes, 100%. 
so that's pretty nice um, because it makes sure that uh, our cash flow is uh, is constantly going. So that's pretty good. Um, but it's also a good way to to get to know new clientele and to really open the barrier or break the barrier for people that are um, afraid to you know get into this passion because it's very easy to uh, reach a lot of people all over the world with social media with instagram with youtube and regardless if they're going to buy a watch or not it's it's great to have them on board as a as a member of the watch society so i think uh, instagram did a great uh, is a great factor for us that comes into play when uh, it's about expanding our business so instagram's great for you know getting your message out there and sort of helping sell and promote your watches does it go the other way are you buying through social media as well yeah, for sure. I think we get um, around 20 to 25 watches offered every day by just sitting here and mainly because of Instagram. So when people Google vintage watches, they uh, pretty quickly come to our page. And it's very easy to just DM us with the watch you have that you want to sell and uh, give your asking price. And then we can say yes or no, and we can wire the money. You can send the watch. It's very easy. We do that a lot, like international. Um but it's still what really is the way the best way of doing business for me is the first owners that actually come into the store you know the netherlands had a great past with watches they loved watches already like since the 1950s so we actually get quite some people in the store uh, that got their watch from their grandfather or whatever and those are those make up for the best stories for me but we still buy a lot of watches via instagram yeah very cool i'm i'm curious if this sort of big social media uh, presence has backfired and 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 you know obviously there's a lot of positive but there's you know potential negative as well i i remember recently the store was robbed and and i and i wonder if this was linked but but ha- has it ever backfired on you yeah for sure so um exactly what you said we've had uh, unfortunately encountered many um robberies well i say mm-hmm. many because i think it's three on the store now and two on me personally and it's also triggered by social media for sure, because I believe when you attract 160,000 people to your account, mm. at least 100 of them have bad intentions. So you you come onto their radar too. So I do think, because we, we are not afraid to show everything, you know, we show the prices, we never put price on request or whatever. We show where we are and where we go, obviously, we mm. only post after we leave, mm-hmm. uh, but still it's not that hard to keep track of us. And we actually show our faces quite often. So people do recognize us a lot. So it's, um, it's not that hard to, uh, to do stupid things to us. <laughs> <laughs> Yet we of course have, um, when we travel, for example, with watches or with cash, we always have, um, uh, security with us. Yeah. And it sounds like that's sort of, um, pa- part of parcel with you know being a dealer in the 21st century as well but if i that most recent robbery looked to be fairly significant and and, and a pretty nasty one throughout that process though you and the team see to seem to stay really positive how did you bounce back from that you know arguably you know reasonable hit yeah for sure we lost like 400k in watches and all of these watches were uh very easy to sell watches so besides losing 400,000 in watches your whole stock is dead because you're left with like 20 more watches um so it was kind of hard to bounce back because not only we lost a lot of money on the watches but also the upcoming weeks we had trouble getting the watches again because of course it takes a lot of time to find the right watches for the right price and for and you have to service them and everything so it takes some time to bounce back from it but luckily we were really um blessed with the watch community a lot of dealers that approached us and said oh i'm so sorry i read about what happened to you you know what just take these 10 watches off of me and when you've sold them you can pay me you don't have to pay me now but then you at least have some stock so we actually got quite some dealers that uh opted in into uh our recovery and we're very grateful for that yeah that's i mean you know that's you know the watch communities you know makes it great it's not just sort of the dealers that are, you know, having to deal with this heightened, you know, security and concerns around theft. In some markets, I'm thinking about the UK, you sort of hear a lot about um, targeted watch crime. Do you think it's on the rise or and is that just uh, because of increased awareness in social media? Well, obviously, 
crime has always been here and it will always be here i'm afraid uh, but definitely social media plays a huge role in it you know uh, famous people or even lesser lesser known people they post pictures on on holiday wearing their watch you know it's pretty easy for a criminal to google what watch he or she is wearing and find out it's a watch that's worth 10,000 40,000 100,000 euros and they can even follow these people on instagram and they see ah they're leaving to ibiza now and in ibiza they're not wearing their watch so probably it's at home so then they go for a robbery at their home or something like that you know so i think it is uh, and it will always be there, but social media played a, a great role in the, in that too. Yeah, it's really interesting to sort of hear how the um, h- how the watch community came together, especially dealers uh, who you know in other industries might be viewed as competitors and and, and helped you through that period. What I want to ask you, uh, yeah, there's back on the social media topic. You've done you've done quite a few stunts in the time period that I've been following you, which is probably four or five years now. One that like shook me to my core was losing a uh, what looked like a Patek Philippe off of a, a boat or a gondola um, or whatever it was in the middle of a river, and then just like radio silence. That was uh, that was a, quite an interesting way to get attention. How do you keep these ideas fresh? Well, uh, these kind of things just happen, man. And to be honest, it often happens. We get the best ideas when we're drunk. And we're drunk four out of five times. So that's that's a great thing. You know, we were just sailing with the boat with some clients and, and our staff. And we uh, we made this like joke because one of our clientele that got a fake Patek Philippe. Uh, so we said, ah, just bring it here and we will pretend like we used the real 5711 to open a bottle and then accidentally lose it in the water. So that's just it. It, it just came to our mind to do that on the spot and we did that um and then we thought okay now it might be a smart thing to not post anything because then people obviously will believe it happened and the funniest of things was that the next day there there were like five or six people lined up in diving gear to go swimming there (laughs) so it also yeah, it also reached uh, the media. Like uh, people are are jumping in a canal to find a Patek, but the Patek was a fucking fake, you know. So that that was it was just great media coverage, and we had a great laugh at it. Um, and it's because, nice. of course, we hate fakes, so it's always fun to use that to uh, make a joke out of it. Yeah, absolutely. So you don't just use your sort of your big platform to to you know pull pranks. You also use it to educate the community and, and consumers have you seen that pay off for you in any way um well first of all what we always say is buy the seller and it is really something that i believe in not only that i say it, so i want people to buy it from me but i know for a fact because i've done a lot of business and every time i did a deal that um i didn't really like it was because i didn't like the seller and there was something shady about the seller or the platform it was sold on for example the biggest platform Chrome 24 out of the 12 deals i did there at least half was really shitty and i've done maybe 20 bad deals in my life that i lost money and a half of them were with Chrome 24 deals so i just really want to emphasize when you're buying a watch um, that you actually either have to do a lot of research yourself or build up a good relationship or buy it from somebody that's trustworthy and reputable. And it's not only, of course, our account, but you have many more dealers that I, I would definitely buy blind from them. So without sending a picture, they would say, I have this watch, it's in great condition, this is my asking price. I would say, yes, I'll wire you the money right now without seeing any pictures because I know they're good guys, you know, they're, they're good watch dealers. Um, but there are, are many, nine out of 10 are not that good. They just want to make a lot of money. So it's good to educate people on that uh, on that account. So we always do, for example, the quizzes on Sunday. Every Sunday we do a quiz uh, on a particular subject and people catch up pretty quickly with that. So it's, it's fun to see. And uh, we have a lot of um, engagement on that too. People like to uh, increase their knowledge. And this is a fun way of doing it. Yeah, that's really interesting, and uh, you know that that point around sort of uh, buying the seller and buying from respectable and reputable dealers. You know, it's going to cost you more, but that's because there's um, there's a cost and there's investment in finding you know the best quality pieces and these pieces that you'll buy blind. And you know, I know that if someone asks me to help them find a watch, and I grab, I have a list of five or six online dealers that I'll buy for buy from, buy from blind, like you you just mentioned. And then they immediately go back to that sort of online price and find the cheapest 
you know, example from a, a a seller no one's heard of with no rating on, you know, Chrono 24 or something and, you know, you kind of say see you later. But I guess you've mentioned education and, you know, that that hype, that, um, the, the importance that that's had on your business. Now, you have a lot of high-profile clients. Take a look at your Instagram feed um, in any one week and you've got, you know, all sorts of celebrities, uh, athletes coming through the doors. How do you guide, you know, these bigger name people that might have a lot of money but not a lot of, you know, knowledge about watches with their purchases? And that's a great question, actually, because I was afraid you were going to say something like, how do you uh, um, approach famous people or whatever? Because I don't give a fuck if you're famous or if you make uh, 100 million a year or, or 10,000 euros a year. The thing is, what I care about is when we start a relationship, um, we will do it for a long term. And I think especially those people uh, are often misused because they don't have a lot of time. They often have a lot of money and then they just go around and buy everything everywhere. Um, and people tend to use them for their own personal gain or financial gain. Uh, and I think I just started off with like a couple of celebrities. And when you, um, when you work with them properly, they will tell their people, this is a guy you can mm-hmm. trust. So then your clientele and your network just grows. And same goes to say for all these athletes, you know, there are a lot of people that every day their inbox gets spammed for people that want to sell a watch or furniture or a house or cars. And it's hard for them to see who's honest and who's uh, in it for the long run. So they tend to go, um, they tend to choose on, on um, mouth to mouth communication. So when somebody in their football team or in their um in their company says you know you can trust this guy then they approach us so we never actively approach any of these people but just via via they tend to come to us yeah absolutely and i think that's you know word of mouth is always the the, the best way to do word things. Of mouth. that's the one i'm yeah, sorry yeah no, no. Ma- mouth to mouth is if someone uh you know has some problems breathing and you know they're, they're, they're shocked at the prices <laughs> uh, to to the red light district that, that. and that's just mouth to mouth no, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. You mentioned like your work doesn't feel like work. So what do you think the, the, the best part of your job is? The best part, without a doubt, is getting new watches in. I love to purchase watches. I don't really love to sell watches. My colleagues sell most of the watches, to be honest. Uh, but I actually love to purchase the watches, especially when it comes down to a watch I haven't had before. You know, it's like Pokemon. You you want to get a, a Pokemon you haven't seen before. You don't want to get four uh, Pikachus in your team. You want to get that Mewtwo. And the hunt for that for that Pokemon or that, that uh, watch in particular, that is so satisfying and it's so exciting and it's, it's such a thrill. So, for example, I'm working now on a very important watch that I want for quite some time, which is a 6543, a very early Milgaus. Uh, I obtained the 6541, the other early Milgaus a year ago. I have now two. And I really want to add a 6543 now. And I've been working on this deal for two months. And every day I wake up and I'm like, let's go to battle. Let's see if I can close the deal today. So that's the really exciting part about my job, I believe. Amazing, amazing. And you sort of mentioned the best part is buying watches. What's your approach there? Because you know, you've, we've talked a little bit before about how you know, reputation is everything and sort of buying the best you can find what's your approach to sort of buying vintage watches? Well, it goes two ways. We have to make money. Uh, Mm -hmm. So a lot of the watches we buy with our wallet, let's say. Uh, And some of the watches I buy with my heart, more as a collector. Uh, And some of the watches have a big overlap, most of the watches actually. But for example, uh, the Datejust I just mentioned, or the regular Submariners, or a 5711 for that matter. Those are the watches that are very easy to sell. Uh, they bring in good money. So I buy those just with, with knowing that I will earn a lot of money on them. And for example, the Cartier you mentioned earlier on, I started mm. the Cartier stuff like two years ago. And back then, nobody was buying that stuff. So I just bought it because I saw the value in it. I saw how is it possible that I can buy this Cartier Tank Jumbo for 6,000 euros as it's so historically important. It is a well-made watch. It's so romantic. So I'm going to buy it regardless if somebody buys it off of me. Uh, But in the long term, that will also, uh, I believe, will uh, also, uh, I don't know how to say that in English, but it will also gain me a lot um, on a financial platform. But again, I prefer to buy watches that I really love. So 
if I don't sell them, I don't get annoyed by it. I once purchased a, a watch that I really hated, actually. Uh, and then it stayed in the store for two or three months. It was a Panerai back in the days. And then every day I came into the, into the store and I saw that watch, I got annoyed by it. So I didn't want that anymore. So I just purchased watches. And if nobody buys them, worst case scenario, I'll keep them for my private collection and enjoy them myself. <laughs> um that's uh, that's one way to do it. It's, it's not a bad uh, it's not a bad outcome if if you love it. Has there been a time when sort of uh, this heart purchase has uh, maybe kicked off a trend or they've become really hot and it's paid off in a big way? Yeah, for sure. Um, we've seen that with Cartier, for example, that is uh, getting some very very good coverage these days. And three years ago, I have to be honest, I was also not on the Cartier page. So I was also like, nah, that's not a real watch brand, the shitty movements and blah, blah, blah. You know, I didn't care for them, uh, but it got my attention. And now I love them in a totally different way than I love Udmach Piquet or that I love Patek or Rolex. It's, it's, I look at them in a totally different way, more aesthetically, more in a romantic kind of way. Uh, but the same goes to say more recently, for example, for the Udmach Piquet uh, Canchem Perpetuel, the classic models, so not the Royal Oaks, but just the, the um, dress watches. Because many people give credit to the Royal Oak for saving Oudmach Piquet back in the 70s after a quartz crisis. But it was actually also the, Q, the QP, the Contemporary Perpetuel. Mm -hmm. And if you put that in perspective, I mean, the quartz crisis obviously was a period that was very hard for the watchmakers. Uh, but instead, Oudmach Piquet said, you know what? Fuck it. We're going to make the thinnest automatic perpetual calendar ever. That's such a bold move. And that also saved them from... Uh, from going under so i really enjoyed that watch and when i purchased my first one it was a year ago i paid like eight thousand euros and now they go easily for double and i believe we have a fair share of that price increase because we created a market for that too so it's it's fun to see especially when the models are in smaller quantities you know it's very hard to do this on a submariner or on a fucking uh, daytona because there's so many out there you cannot influence the market but on these niche models you can still have effect on the market and pretty quickly too yeah i think you're right and i think that's um i sort of want to circle back to cartier a little bit and you're talking about um sort of coming to the brand and you know falling in love with it a little bit and cartier is great because there are so many models it's got you know obviously over a hundred years of watchmaking behind them there's so many things you can discover you know day by day what do you what sort of made you fall in love with Cartier well in all fairness the pictures that I saw online like I saw some pictures of for example Andy Warhol or Princess Diana and every time I saw these important people they were wearing Cartiers especially the mm. more sophisticated ones so that really triggered me to dig deeper into Cartier because apparently a lot of high profile people and a lot of important people and influential people enjoyed these Cartiers. Why are why am I only looking at Rolex watches? You know, because they attract me more, more my lifestyle. Uh, but I started enjoying Cartier therefore because I understand the historical importance and um, also their prestige that they really have. And I think it's just, a brand that has so much more potential in the secondhand market. Of course, all Rolex watches are now more expensive than they ever were. But with Cartier, it was the other way around. You know, you can buy a, a new Cartier Panther for 25,000 euros, or you can buy a beautiful vintage ones, with, which is v way nicer in my opinion. And they are like 7,000 euros. So I really understood the value that was still to gain in the, the secondary market or vintage market. And that is also business wise, of course, and, uh, an interesting move but mainly i started to buy them because i just wanted to expand my knowledge on cartier and there is such little literature about cartier if you take a look at the submariner you can you can buy four or five books only about the 5513 for example mm. but on cartier there are just very few books very few websites very few real connoisseurs so it was really an interesting um it it, it actually triggered my interest just because there was so little known about it and the past two three years that already um expanded really uh, big because there are many collectors now of Cartier uh, but there were also some early adapters for example John Goldberger who saw this way before me of course uh, but it's interesting to see because I do believe we are still at the very beginning of the Cartier hype yeah I think you're probably right with that. Uh, and I find it interesting, you know, Cartier is very, very smart, I think, in terms of their new product offering 
how they they'll run in a cycle. So you know, obviously at the moment, the the Pasha is their sort of product that they're focusing on, uh, and it is I think exactly thirty years old now. Are you seeing those eighties reference Pashas getting an increased attention because of the new releases? Hell yeah! We just saw the crazy Pasha Grill, which for me is one of the coolest watches. It's it's so wrong, you know. If you if you show it to somebody else, they would be horrified if you don't understand the watch you're like why the fuck would i buy this this makes no sense but then you start to wear the watch you start to to um really look at the watch and you really get that 80s vibes for example uh we recently had a watch that supposed to be that's supposed to belong to uh, mike tyson he gave it to uh, don king which was a cartier pasha and then a guy sold it to us but then when I saw that watch, that was the first Pasha I ever bought. I thought like, okay, I need to dig deeper into Pashas. Because even when I loved Cartier two years ago, when I started loving it, I still hated the Pasha. But I have to be honest, I fucking love the Pasha right now. <laughs> Speaking of sort of that 80s design and sort of uh, what Cartier has been doing with their recent releases, you know, the the must, the must, tank must came out uh, you know, a couple of months ago now in the, that red, green, and blue colorway. What do you think of what do you think of that offering and sort of the direction that Cartier might be heading? Well, they use their Lemus line like Rolex uses Tudor. You know, they can be a little bit more creative. They can be a little bit more outrageous or or try new things. For example, on the Lemus line, they now have that solar powered stuff. It doesn't go well and it doesn't sit right with the, the traditional clientele of Cartier, I believe. So therefore, the Lemus line comes in very handy as Rolex uses uh, Tudor, for example. Um, yet I have to say I do not really enjoy the Lemus line so much because I always will feel like I am buying uh, like a shittier Cartier, <laughs> to put it bluntly. Uh, so that's not my my style, but I really do enjoy their the way to approach also the the younger clientele because these watches are like retail two point six thousand euros. So it's also a watch that you can buy when you're eighteen or nineteen for many people at least. So it's also a good way to uh, wheel in new clientele that in maybe 10 years or 5 years or 15 years will actually buy those highly complicated pieces or the haute joie that they have or, you know, nicer models of Cartier. So it's a, it's a strategic, uh, strategic move. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, and I think if you might, even if you don't like the, the Muster Cartier, I'm sure you're a fan of the the cloche that they also released this year as part of their Privé collection. Those releases, you know, you've seen the the Asymmetric and the Cintre before that. Is there a model from Cartier's back catalogue that you would love to see get um, that sort of re-edition or recreation treatment? Yeah, the the cloche. You hit it right on the, on the, the spot there, Felix. I love the cloche. Such a cool model uh, that I uh, enjoyed myself for a while, a vintage one. Um, and I think also the the aesthetics of, of those kind of models, they're very uncommon and they're very interesting to see um, because it actually triggers you to look further. And for example, if you see a Calatrava, you just see a simple dress watch. And I do not have that with the cloche. Um, another watch that I really would want to see in more configurations is um, the Basculant, so the reversible watch from That's Cartier. Good. That's so cool. And they made one before. Now it's called the Basculant, of course. But back in the days, it was called the... Um, the What's the name again? Ah, fuck, now I forgot. It. The Cadillac. It's called the Cadillac. So back in the days, they called it like that. Yeah. And those are even cooler, in my opinion. That's the vintage kind of models of uh, of, of the, the Basculant. Here's a, here's a business question for you. Do you think that Cartier will, um, obviously they're part of the Richemont group, do you think they will never release another Basculant just because of uh, JLC and the Reverso? Or do you think they'd go there? Well, that's that's the interesting part, and uh, it's it's very good that you mentioned that. That's the reason why I believe the Basculant is gaining a lot of popularity, like on the vintage models. And the twenty three ninety is a reference that doubled in price in four months, a steel one. Uh, but also, I believe because they will never make a Basculant like that again because of Jésus Le Coutre and uh, the Reverso. So I think you hit the nail on the head. Yeah, that's really interesting. And so you mentioned that you had a Basculant in your personal collection. I'm curious to hear what uh, your your collection looks like these days and, and what you have that you won't sell ever. 
the watches that I will never sell are the watches with a personal story to me. Uh, they don't, uh, regardless of the value, they they don't have a price tag. So, for example, my first Rolex that I purchased was a simple 1601, uh, which I got back in the days for like two grand. Uh, I wouldn't sell it for 40 or 50 or whatever, even though the watch is worth maybe five. It's my watch. You know, it doesn't have a price tag. The same goes to say for two watches that got stolen from me in a robbery, one an armed robbery in Argentina that I got back recently. I will never sell that watch again. Uh, and another one that got stolen from my home. Uh, those are the watches that I got back. And, that you know, for me, they belong to me now. I, I put in a lot of effort to get them back. So I will never let's say goodbye to them. But furthermore, I like to have um, a collection that is well-balanced or so with different styles. So I can wear one with a suit. I can wear one with shorts, you know. So it, I, I have it covered style-wise. And furthermore, it uh, consists mainly of Rolex models because that's just the watch that I like to wear the most. It's just so comfortable. Nine out of ten days, I prefer to wear a Rolex. Uh, and depending on, on the day, I'm wearing a Day-Date or a Milgauss, for example. But I tend to never go higher in size or bigger in size than 38 millimeters because it's too big for my wrist. Yeah, it's really interesting that, um, that you say that. I have a question, uh, and I probably should have asked it earlier, but... How do you define vintage in a watch sense? That is one of the fucking hardest questions to answer because it's not like antique, you know, when it's 100 years old, it's antique. But I believe there are many watches that are 50 years old that aren't vintage to me and that there are many watches that are 20 years old that are more vintage to me. Uh, reason being because they stand for an epoch and they... Uh, survived the the time not only aesthetically but also quality wise so that's what i said some watches that are 50 year old to me are just old watches they're they were never built in the 70s for example they were never some watches were never built to last forever so then it doesn't deserve the stamp vintage obviously vintage is now a hot topic so it gets used a lot so it's it's hard to say but for me and a watch from the 90s can be considered vintage too if it really grasps the epoch or the style of that era. For example, uh, the Nautilus, of course, is a 50-year-old watch, but the 3700 can be definitely considered vintage to me. Yet a Quartz Omega Sea Monster from the 70s doesn't really deserve that stamp, in my humble opinion. Once again, I am very sure there are many people that disagree with me on this, but for me, it's also a stamp of quality and a stamp of design. It's, it's interesting that you sort of talk about quality because I had a, a, a question around that. Obviously, in your job, you must deal with a lot of, a lot of hype. You're, like, you're, you're selling sports Rolexes, you're selling Patek. How do you think that rarity of genuine rarity and quality, will they always be better than hype or does hype win? That is an interesting question. Uh, first of all, I believe in two factors that come into play, and that's condition and originality, especially when it comes down to older models. It's not uncommon uh, that the watch has been worn. You know, many, many uh, Rolex models were just not that expensive back in the days, and people just wore them every day, and it's not uncommon to have uh, swapped hands or swapped bezel, but it does uh, depend or, or it does deteriorates the price or the originality so i think it's very important to buy those two things and what i believe is a big big hype that will soon burst hopefully is the whole box and papers bullshit because that's something i can i can promise you right here right now that 90 percent of the watches of the rolex watches from before 1990 have fake papers. Uh, that is something I truly believe in because I know many people that create these fake papers. I know they're almost impossible to uh, uh, differentiate from the real ones. And with a watch, you can always do that, but with the papers, you can't. You know, these papers are worth now sometimes for a vintage Daytona, they ask 10,000 euro premium. But the, these papers were never made to be not duplicated so it's pretty easy to do and sometimes they even use the original old papers that haven't been filled in but then they use the original stamping machine of rolex that was sold on ebay many times for crazy amounts uh, so they produce these papers so back in the days many people threw away their paper when their guarantee expired and nowadays people pay crazy prices for a piece of fucking paper that's something that really boggles my mind and i definitely think that's a hype and i hope the hype will end soon because box and papers are bullshit yeah i think that's a really interesting point for a question that i that i have and i hope you sort of might have a might have a story for us but you know being a, a seasoned 
vintage dealer. And, you know, you kind of mentioned a few um, bad transactions, I say, with inverted commas. But what I'm curious is, is there a, a transaction that nearly took place that, you know, what we might call a near miss that, you know, you learn a lot from? Um, you know, you might have been really close to buying something and then your gut said this was off or this was off or could have gone really bad for you, but uh, you kind of realized at the last minute. Well, I have some examples too that it really went bad for me and I lost uh, 10,000 of euros. So that's also interesting to to maybe uh, yeah, go yeah, dig nice. deeper uh, because I do believe you win some or you learn some. Now that might also sound tacky, but my greatest lessons were lessons I have to pay for. Uh, one was resolved two weeks ago uh, when I purchased my first Rolex Milgauss. As I mentioned earlier on, that's my Creo watch, my 6541. Uh, and like three years ago, I uh, I found one on Krona24 from a guy that was a Krona24 sales manager even. Uh, and I pulled the trigger on it like it was a close to 100,000 euro watch. And it had service papers from Rolex. So Rolex actually serviced the watch. So I thought, oh, everything's will be fine but i never had a 6541 in my hand i only saw a couple on blurry pictures so i didn't exactly know what to look for uh, then when i got the watch in it just felt off you know it was on a leather strap and the 6541 usually was always delivered on a metal bracelet of course the bracelet can be taken off or destroyed after a time or, or replaced whatever but it didn't left any scratches where usually like the ears of the end links are it didn't left any scratches or nothing so it already felt off i tr i started geigering it to see the radioactivity and the radioactivity didn't match for the period and the use of the material so everything just started to feel weird and after a week of thorough investigation i concluded the watch was not um original rolex of, of course it had original parts it had an altered case it had an original rolex movement therefore rolex also serviced it um but it wasn't an original milgauss as i wanted it to be so i wanted to return the watch and the seller wasn't willing to take it back so we had a legal fight for three years almost three years and i just returned the watch uh, like two or three weeks ago wow Wow, and people aren't as lucky as as as, as you. Sometimes the the seller disappears into uh, thin air, or they buy it online, and the the you know the seller you know from somewhere someone intercedes, and you just can't you don't have any recourse. And I mean, you know, not to plug your shop too much, but that's sort of the benefit of a bricks and mortar store or an online store that's backed by bricks and mortar. Yeah, and I know I know many many horrible stories, and you've first off asked um, if I almost pulled the trigger once but didn't and that happened i love as i'm a gemologist i love stones and i love stone dials so the first stone dial that i really really wanted to buy was the opal dial that got into auction at phillips i think in 2018 and it sold at the glamorous dated auction for like 80 grand now back then in 2018 i didn't have the funds to ever buy that watch but it ended up on auction again in 2020 or 2019 maybe in the dubai auction of christie's so i thought okay let's book a plane ticket i'm not gonna let this watch slip again this watch i'm gonna buy it if it goes under 100k i'm definitely gonna buy it and i studied the pictures in the catalog of both phillips and christie's and everything seemed fine but then i had the watch in my hand and i started looping the watch and everything and the the finishing of the date window it wasn't signed swiss uh, it, it just didn't make sense um so I am fairly sure, with 99.9% .9 sure, the watch uh, isn't original. Therefore, also this, the buyer that bought it first at Philips returned it to the auction. But again, it did like 70 or 75,000 euros. But the same day, I decided not to buy it because I felt there were some issues with the originality of the dial. And I'm pretty sure I made a good call on that. Yeah, that that was uh, maybe you dodged a bullet, as they say. For sure. Um, <laughs> Now you've talked, you, you mentioned a little while ago, you had a Panerai in, in the shop that made you sad. Um, yeah. <laughs> and you've also, you've talked about, you know, wanting to sort of end the whole box and papers obsession. Are there, I want to sort of, you know, maybe have these two questions meet. Are there any models that you're professionally or personally just a bit over that you think people need to move on from? First of all, but I've never got into that because i don't believe in those watches uh, but i what i hate is the 41 millimeter day just stuff or the 41 millimeter day date i believe the traditional and correct sizing is 36 for gentlemen 
uh, and it goes to say for almost all two big watches i there are no watches in my opinion over 41 millimeters that look well proportioned um but still i do from time to time so nautilus for example 5980 that is slightly bigger and thicker also but then it's a watch that i can't wear so i can never enjoy it and therefore i lost some of the feeling with it and i believe people need to uh, look better to the historical sp- perspective on sizing because the gentleman sizing on dress watch was 32 33 millimeters and sportier models can be up to 36 or 38 but now sizes have gone up to like 40 41 for a day date which in my opinion is a dress watch it just looks outrageous it looks cheap it doesn't doesn't sit well with me so i always uh tell my clientele to buy the original sizing but still i feel sometimes inclined to go into the business of selling those day dates or day just because there's so many people asking about it on our instagram for example that it's easy to make an exception and say okay whatever i fucking hate the watch but you want it so bad so i'm gonna buy it anyways but luckily we've never done that but it's sometimes hard to uh to say no to the hype well it's it's uh, yeah it's part of the job i guess at the end of the day and I get, part of the job, uh, Jasper, is you know these 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 clients, and some of them are more high profile than other others. And I'm going to ask you uh, first of all, you probably can't, but I'm going to ask you if you can. Yeah. Can you tell us about selling Ellen a watch? Yeah, well, actually, I can. Uh, the thing is, um, on many clientele, we signed NDAs mm-hmm. uh, because you're not allowed to to say anything about it. I have uh, very cool stories which I cannot share, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, but on Ellen, from day one, it was set in stone that it's okay to share everything about it, you know. Well, obviously, I didn't share, I never shared any prices or whatever. I, I don't say what I sold or a watch to. But often, it's a watch that has been on my site and then it ends up in Ellen's collection. You can do the math yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, but Ellen, when I spoke to Ellen, we spoke regularly, like on a weekly basis on the telephone and everything. And I, I told her about watches. And she was always happy to display her love for timepieces as well because with her it wasn't only about showing off or to show that you have money or whatever but she genuinely enjoyed watches she also purchased quite some lower range watches for me because she liked the story of the watch and uh, when i told her the story about the watch she was like okay i'll get it um so that 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 was the fun part and same goes to say when i um for example sold her the jps the john player special Mm. um I asked her, is it okay to post a picture on my my Instagram that we were sitting in her uh, living room and that she was buying the watch? Because what I loved about the picture is she was wearing shorts. So basically, this woman comes in in a t-shirt and shorts and casually purchases one of the most sought-after models in history. So I thought it was real funny, and I was sitting there in a suit, so I liked the contradiction. So I asked if I could post that picture and she uh, she said yeah that's fine for sure and then the new york times picked up on it and posted it uh in their uh, uh gossip section or whatever and they the article read the title read ellen DeGeneres by seven hundred fifty thousand dollar watch but obviously i would never share a price but you can easily google it but that's the point that uh, the relationship of ellen and me kind of turned sour because she suspected that i said the price of the watch to the new york times which obviously i didn't yeah it's sort of interesting isn't it people kind of google it and pick a number out of the air and yeah with watch spotting on the internet it's as you say it's not hard to join dots and for people to kind of do their own research as well but i mean you've you know you've had a or had her or slash have her as a client which is um which is pretty incredible and i think it's a you know it's a testament when you have someone so high high profile and you've got many clients like this that uh, really seek out the best quality and i guess the follow-up question i have is how do you how do you find the best quality and 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 do you feel pressure to kind of really deliver to these clients that when they say that you know money might not necessarily be the object i want the best you know yeah john player special that we can find Yeah, well, the thing about a JPS, for example, is not about how much money you want to spend. First of all, it's about how are you going to fucking find the watch. Back when Ellen said she wanted to, because I bought this, I sourced this for her. She said she was looking for one for two years already, but couldn't find a proper one. So it doesn't matter if you want to spend 500K or 1 million or 2 million for that watch. First of all, you got to locate the watch. And I knew four people that had a John Player Special. So I approached these four people. One of them, the condition was off. 
So that watch was dropped. It was way cheaper too, but it wasn't the condition that I want to deliver, especially it's still, you know, a very important and, and expensive watch. So I think, I believe you have to have a top class. Um, and the, from the other three, two people weren't willing to sell regardless. So these are collectors that have a crazy amount of watches. They don't need the money. They don't want to sell it. So it doesn't matter what you're going to offer it to, uh, what you're going to offer them. Um, but luckily, my fourth collector was willing to let go of it in uh, exchange of a, a specific watch. So then again, I had to search for that watch again to put it into the trade. So it, <laughs> a deal like this takes two or three months. Uh, but, you know, the, the lady in question, Ellen, was already waiting for a watch like this for two years now. So you can wait another two or three months, I believe. Absolutely. Now, I think ending on, you know, John Player Specials and Alan DeGeneres is, is a, you're going to end on a high note. But I have one more question for you, Jasper. Yes. And it might be the hardest question we've got because it can't be about watches. Oh, fuck me. I know, right? Uh, what have you been doing, you know, maybe watching or reading or listening to to pass time that doesn't involve, you know, checking Chrono24 or your WhatsApp for, you know, <laughs> vintage Rolex? Uh, it's so hard. You know, I don't watch Netflix series or I don't watch television. I do watch soccer. So uh, that's something I do regularly. But my social life is pretty fucking boring, especially due to COVID. So we don't sure. really have any parties. Um, and all my social activities actually involves clientele. So when we do fun stuff, we bring out our clientele too. So it's it's really hard. I like to read autobiographies because I learn from them too. Uh, so to answer your question, I'm a dull guy. I only fucking work. I only do watches. Um, but next to it, you know, I like a good book. Yeah, cool. I'm reading now, which is really a recommendation. I'm yeah. reading now the autobiography of um, the drummer of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, which is such an interesting guy. It's so far out of my world, but still, you know, it it really is What's interesting. He looks like Will Ferrell, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but it's a cool guy. So I like to, uh, yeah, you have always the joke that it looks like Will Ferrell, Chad Smith. But, um, That's it. It's 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 just so funny to to read something about somebody's world that's totally apart from from my world. So I like that too. Amazing! That's a great recommendation, uh, Jasper. Thank you so much for coming on. We'll link up your Instagram account. We'll link up your YouTube videos, and of course, Amsterdam Vintage Watches. Thank you so much for joining Felix and I. Well, Felix and uh, Andy, it was my pleasure. I hope the sound is not that bad. Once again, I apologize because I'm a I'm a vintage motherfucker. So also my uh, my audio engineering is not uh, up to date. Yet I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much, Jasper. Have a lovely day. Take care, guys. Felix, what a fun episode. We covered a lot of bases here. Thank you, Tag Hoyer, mm-hmm. for sponsoring today's episode. Please go check out the new Aqua Racer online or in store. And Felix, the new Mario if you watch. Want to, yeah, and the new Mario watch. Um, all things Tag Hoyer. Felix, if you want to uh, get in touch with us, you can do it by our Discord. There's a link in our Instagram bio or in the show notes, or you can hit us at the Gmail, otpodcast at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. Felix, what's our Instagram? Ot.podcast. Love it. Yep. Love it. Guys, thank you so much for supporting the show. Thank you for listening. Don't forget our Discord. Uh, leave five star reviews. Tell your friends. Tell your neighbors. Tell, you know. Tell the vintage watch dealer. Rec- tell, you, tell your watch dealer. Get everyone listening. Yep. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll catch you very soon. Next time. Soon. Sooner than you think.